welcome Kevin Car. We are even happier to welcome uh, Kevin Carter, uh, who is an internationally recognized expert in emerging and frontier markets with over of two decades of work alongside longtime Princeton economist and author of A Random Walk Down Wall Street, Dr. Burton Malkiel. Kevin is the founder and CIO of EMQQ Global, which is the creator of three emerging market technology indexes, EMQQ, INQQ, and FMQQ, which is tracked by ETFs listed on the NS uh, on the NYSE, and uh, I believe that specifically we will focus on INQQ as the topic of tonight is a conference on India. The title that we've been given is, uh, and I quote, "Is India the perfect emerging market?" Uh, India is obviously very much in the news uh, over the last couple of days, weeks, and months as the next big things in emerging markets. So uh, with no further ado, Kevin, uh, please, the floor is yours. Okay, lovely. And thank you very much. And uh, thanks for having me. And thank you for uh, tuning in uh, this evening. So I'm going to go uh, really fast, especially at the beginning. And uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself and uh, how I got involved with emerging markets. And then I'll get into the India part of the story. Uh, via China. As was mentioned, my my business and my life uh, are uh, centered around uh, investing in emerging markets, internet companies. And we have three different versions of what we do. Um, the Our flagship and our, our namesake is EMQQ, which incorporates all emerging and frontier markets. Uh, we have an ex-China fund. So it's the same thing without China, which is FMQQ. And then we have an India only version. In terms of myself, and I know that I uh, presented to your uh, organization uh, in the last year or two, um, so I'll go fast through the, the beginning of this, but I, I live in San Francisco, California, 15 miles east of San Francisco. I've lived here my whole life. I went away for college for four and a half years and came back here in January of 1992. I had one interview at a company called Robertson Stevens and Company, which was the leading technology investment bank in San Francisco through the 80s and 90s. And uh, the interview was about 20 minutes. We talked about college sports mostly. And then I was told that I could start Monday. And I said, I don't know anything about investing. How can I start Monday? And they said, go buy this book. And they wrote down a random walk down Wall Street. Now, some of you uh, I'm sure uh, know about this book, and some of you probably have also read it. It was written by this guy, Bert Malkiel, um, uh, who's a Princeton economist, and it was first written in 1972. And the reason the book is is so well known is that in that original edition, he laid out on page 226 his suggestion which was that somebody should make an index fund, a, a, a mutual fund that owned all the stocks. It didn't buy and sell. It charged a low fee. And he suggested the New York Stock Exchange do it as a not-for-profit uh, operation. They did not do it, but uh, Burton's friend John Bogle did launch an index fund a couple of years later, and Vanguard and the indexing revolution were born. So this guy and his book are foundational in the world of indexing and ETFs. In addition to proposing index funds before there were index funds, uh, Burton was the chairman of the committee that created the very first ETF, the Spider. So that's how I started. But when it comes to investing, I am an Omaha person first and foremost. So I try to look at every business, every investment decision through a a Charlie Munger and Warren Buffett lens. But I've ended up as partners for the last 25 years with this guy. The first thing we did was commercialize an idea I had, which was to allow people to buy stocks in dollar amounts instead of share amounts. So you instead of buying 100 shares of Coca-Cola, which might cost $5,000, you could buy $100 of Coca-Cola. It might only be a, a share or a half a share or 0.7 shares. But it seemed like it really was something the world needed to uh, cut out some of the costs of investing. And so we started this, I started this business and I asked Burton to be an advisor and we ended up selling it to E-Trade in the year 2000. After that, we kept at it and we created this other thing called direct indexing, 
we didn't call it direct indexing. We called it active indexing. The idea is to build your own custom index, uh, you know, portfolio in a separate account. You'd base it on the S and P 500, but if you wanted to leave out alcohol or tobacco or oil, you could do that. But more importantly for U.S. investors, you could loss harvest your uh, for tax purposes, and you could actually beat the index on an after-tax basis. So. Uh, we sold that to a French firm in Boston called the Texas in 2004. But right before we sold the company, Google went public. And uh, uh, they asked my partner Burton to give a talk to their employees about investing. Um, Eric Schmidt, the chairman of, of Google at the time, and Burton were friends from Princeton uh, and various Princeton committees that they had been on together. And so Bill Sharp and Burton gave a talk to the Google employees uh, just before the IPO, and I wasn't invited, but a few months later, someone from Google called me and said, hey, I heard about this direct indexing. How do I invest with you? And I I told them we didn't work with individual investors, that we only worked with advisors, but he had a lot of money, and he convinced me that I should basically be his financial advisor as a side job, and I said, okay, fine, and then he started introducing me to other people at Google, and so in 2005, I start going down to Mountain View pretty much once a week to meet with some other engineer who's made a lot of money, uh, and, uh, even at that point. And uh, while I'm going back and forth to Mountain View, uh, Burton starts going to China. Um, a couple of uh, his uh, Princeton economist friends um, had... Uh, uh, returned to China to teach economics in Beijing, and they had convinced Burton that he ought to go and visit China and see this economic miracle that was just getting started uh, in the early 2000s. And so he starts going to China when I'm going to Mountain View, and he writes a white paper. The Google people heard about it and called me and asked if Burton would come down to Mountain View and talk about investing in China. I said, fine, next time he's in town, uh, we can do that. And 18 years ago, next Friday, I left San Francisco and I stopped by the airport. I picked up Burton and we drove down to Google and he gave this talk. And after he was done, everybody looked at me and said, we want to invest in China. So now at that point, I didn't know very much about China and I had never been to China before, but somehow my entire life now, uh, has been for uh, now almost 20 years completely focused on how do you invest in China and other emerging markets. So now that's how I got here. Let me tell you what I learned uh, at a high level. The first question is, you know, where are emerging markets? Like how big are they? Which one's bigger? Is is uh, Vietnam important? Is Korea important? Is uh, Poland important? If you look on a, if you look on it, if you look at it on a map, in terms of the size, the population size, the uh, economy size, and also the stock market size, this is largely about Asia, about sixty percent Asia, with China and India being the biggest parts. It's about fifteen percent Latin America, with. Brazil and Mexico representing about two thirds. And then the other 25% is scattered all over the place from South Africa to Morocco, to Poland, to Kazakhstan. So that's what it looks like on the map. A simpler way to think about it is, is where are the people themselves? And it just happens to be the case that there's basically three different parts of the story. There's 1.4 billion people in India, there's a little less than that now in China, and there's a little less than that in the other category. And in the other category, it's about one third Southeast Asia and one third your region in Latin America. So that's where the people are. Now, why do people want to invest in emerging markets? What is the case for investing in this area for uh, you know, US investors? It's pretty simple, and this is the, the list of the reasons. There's a, a, there's a lot of people. B, or two, they're young and have better demographics. Their economies are growing faster, and that's driving consumption. And those things are all true, and they remain true. 
Uh, emerging markets have 85% of the world's people. They have about 90% of the people under the age of 30. So they represent the, the, the present and the future. Their economies uh, passed the developed world a long time ago. And every year they get further and further ahead because they're growing faster. And it's driving consumption. And this is the most important thing this is something I learned on the first day, and I didn't have to figure this out. It's been very well documented for a long time. The thing that's emerging are six and a half billion people that want stuff. They want all of the things that many or most Americans take for granted. They want more and better food, more and better clothing. They want appliances, air conditioners. They want to be entertained, go to a movie, take a vacation. They want an automobile and they want their kids to go to Harvard. And again, I didn't have to figure this out. It was very well documented by a lot of other people. And you can see that McKinsey calls it the biggest growth story ever. So maybe they're wrong and it's the second biggest or third biggest. But if you're going to invest in emerging markets, this is what you should focus on. This is what I've been focused on for 18 plus years now. So now the only other thing to know about emerging markets is the indexes are terrible. And I learned about this on the first day after we got back to San Francisco uh, from Google 18 years ago, I went straight over to our portfolio managers and I said, the Google guys want to invest in China. Give me a list of all the companies in the China ETF, because 18 years ago, there was only one China ETF on the planet, the iShares original China fund with the ticker symbol FXI, because I, and I asked for the list of the companies because I assume that's what we would use for these people at Google. But since I'm an Omaha person, I don't, I don't care about the name of a fund. I want to know what are the businesses that we're going to own if we buy the fund. And so I asked for the list and that's when Burton pulled me aside and explained to me that 80% of the China index was government owned banks and oil companies, state owned enterprises. And that these companies have conflicts of interest. They're inefficient. Governance isn't very good and corruption is rampant. Now, people in emerging markets know this very well because it's in the paper all the time and you don't have to look very far. You can take, I, I, I haven't gone through every state-owned enterprise, but I'm pretty sure if you Google the name of a state-owned company and the word corruption or scandal, you'll find lots of headlines and lots of people going to jail for stealing money as we've seen uh, in Brazil and elsewhere. So now let's look at what happened if you invested in China via that ETF. Now I'm talking about 18 years ago. This is a 15 year chart of the performance of that fund and the performance of the Chinese economy. The Chinese economy has grown 400% in the last 15 years, but if you bought the FXI, you lost half your money so far. So this is why the indexes for emerging markets are broken. Uh, they're not really participating in the growth, largely because they're conflicted and don't the state-owned enterprises, at least, don't really care about that. So I concluded that what you need to do is what the Ivy League endowments were doing. And that was, they were increasing. In the first half of my emerging market life, I spent most of my time in New York and Boston with a couple dozen family offices and foundations and endowments like Harvard's. And I watched how they were increasing their allocations, but then getting more targeted to capture the growth. And if you were managing the Yale endowment, like David Swenson was, you had a lot of choices. Like you could take the smartest alumni from China and start a private equity fund. But, you know, most investors couldn't do that. And so when people would ask me what to do, I said, that's easy just buy the emerging market consumer stocks, buy the beer companies and the food companies and the Walmart of Mexico and these types of traditional consumer companies. And that was my answer until uh, 10 years ago when someone called me and asked me what was the best emerging market ETF. But when they called me, I answered their call on my first iPhone, which was sitting on my car seat next to me. And as I started to tell the person that they should just buy the emerging market consumer ETF, I had a light bulb moment and said, wait a minute, the best consumer, the best emerging market ETF doesn't exist. And I went back to my office and I started to work on EMQQ, 
which launched 10 years or rather uh, three months later uh, in November of 2014. So now the reason that I think I had that that light bulb moment that morning was that I had been looking at my own portfolio that day and I had five stocks that I owned, all of which were definitely part of the emerging market consumer story, but only three of those five stocks were included in the emerging market consumer ETF that I recommended. They were Chinese uh, uh, food company, Want Want, and Chinese sportswear companies, Li Ning and Peak Sports. This is like the Nabisco and the Reebok and the converse of China. So those were my first three stocks, all of them called consumer stocks in the database. But then I had these two other stocks, one called Wu Ba, the Craigslist of China on the New York Stock Exchange, most profitable company I've ever seen. And the fifth and final company is called Mercado Libre, and it trades on the NASDAQ. And I had looked at my own portfolio and I thought, well, gee, that all of these are parts of the consumer story, but only three of them are in this ETF I tell people to buy because the other two are called technology companies. And while the food and clothing companies were growing at 20%, Mercado Libre and uh, uh, Wu Ba were growing at 120%. And so that's what really inspired EMQQ was the re realization that the smartphone was changing consumption. But what I didn't see as clearly then as I do now is that there's something huge going on in emerging markets. And, and it's likely you see it a lot more than, than I see it when I go out and about. But there's three mega trends that are sweeping the planet right now the, the the situation, though, is that in the United States, most people have been part of these for generations now, so we don't think of them as trends. So what are these three mega trends? First, this one. When I was a kid, we had a car, we took vacations, we had plenty of food. My brothers and I were the first to go to college, but nonetheless, we've been in consumption mode for a while. Now, when I got that call 10 years ago asking about... Uh, uh, emerging market ETFs. I answered the call on my smartphone, which was sitting on the car seat next to me. So I, I had a smartphone 10 years ago, but it was new. I only had it for about a year at that point, but I could already see how it was changing my family's consumption. The reality is I had a computer for 20 years before I got a smartphone. Well, most people in emerging markets have never had a computer. So not only do you have billions of new consumers coming, they're getting their first computer today. And it's not a desktop and it never will be a desktop. It's an Android based smartphone that's getting better and cheaper every year. Right now, 7 million people a month in India are getting their first ever computer. You can now get, as I'll show you, a brand new smartphone in India for $12. So uh, the supercomputer in the pocket is spreading and it's bringing with it something that I got in 1995 called the internet. When I was uh, uh, in my late twenties, the internet showed up here and I had a telephone line and a connection to the internet in 1995. I've, it's gotten better every year since then. And now I can even get it on an airplane, but most of the never, most of the world never got wired. So billions of new consumers getting a computer, getting internet access. And because they don't have bank accounts and credit cards and debit cards, they don't have a car. They probably isn't a big box store anywhere nearby. They're leapfrogging and driving massive consumption. So this is uh, showing you the revenue for the entire emerging markets internet sector going back 15 years. Now, when I launched in 2014, all, all I had were these first five bars. I had this slide, but it was a lot smaller or uh, bigger, I guess, in terms of the bars because there was only five of them. But it seemed pretty likely to be that there was going to be a lot of growth uh, in this uh, internet uh, story. And indeed, it happened in a major way. And that led to significant value creation. Now, obviously, we have a huge crash in the middle of this chart. We had a decline that uh, started in uh, uh, beginning of 2021 uh, or the March, February of 2021. And at one point, we were down almost 70%. But still, for long-term investors, they're up a few hundred percent versus 20% for the broad index. Now, 
This has been largely driven by China. Alibaba and Tencent are the biggest parts of the story, as are the other China internet companies. And the, um, the reality is that, you know, China is an emerging market. And it's the biggest emerging market. But uh, let's move to the uh, rest of the story, because in, in reality, while China is an emerging market in a traditional sense, when it comes to the internet and smartphones and e-commerce, China is the most developed country in the world by far. And it's not even close. And not only does it dwarf the United States, China's e-commerce is four times bigger than every other emerging market combined. So China is uh, on its own level. And if we look at that revenue I showed you, it's also been the story so far. This is the same revenue. This time the gold is China and the other 45 emerging markets are in purple. So 80% of this so far has been China, but guess what? All the people are in the other countries, four times as many people. And while China's e-commerce penetration is 25%, the rest of the countries on a population weighted basis are at 5%. So I don't know how long it's going to take but I'll bet you that this purple revenue is going to go up 10 times and probably 20 times. And the reason is I've never known anybody that used to have a smartphone. And the reality is that there's 3 billion more people in the developing world that don't have a smartphone yet, but they're gonna get one tomorrow or the next day. So this is what we call the third wave, the first if you want to think about them in waves, the first internet wave was the United States and the rest of the developed world starting in the year 2000. Now, when I talk about these waves, I mean, when did millions of people first have a personal computer starting back in 2000 at their home or their apartment, access to the internet, and then they could open a browser on the internet and buy something or sell something from a website. I probably did that in 1997, I shorted Amazon stock in 1998. Um, but in terms of critical mass, let's just say that started in the year 2000. And what happened? From the year 2000 and still continuing today, the FANG stocks took over our lives and our stock market. First on PCs, then on smartphones. That's the first way. As you saw, China was right behind us. And the they were the second wave starting in 2005 and continuing, uh, but the fastest part of that behind us. And now we've got the third wave and India is the biggest part. It's not the only part. Again, one of the most important companies in my life, Mercado Libre, which I'm sure you're all very well familiar with. Uh, the, the first non-China internet company that I stumbled upon when it went public uh, New Bank in uh, Brazil. Now, but I should point out, none of these companies are in the index. If you buy a Vanguard or iShares ETF, you should know that you've never owned any of these internet companies. I won't get into the reasons why, but uh, between you and me, the indexing people don't seem to ask a lot of questions or uh, wonder, why don't we own the best performing stock in all of Latin America when we own Petrobras twice? So, um uh, New bank, not in the index. And the story of all these companies is 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 the same. The smartest kid from every country. I'm making this very black and white. And I should mention that I went to the University of Arizona and at a 2.0 grade point average. So I'm not a I'm not a uh, academic snob. But the, the in general, the way this happens is the smartest kid from every country goes to Harvard or Stanford. Then they go work for Google or Morgan Stanley. Then they go back to Harvard or Stanford. And then they start an internet company. And they get funded by U.S. institutional investors. And this uh, is is the, this virtuous cycle is strongest in Latin America because of Mercado Libre's success. But it's really happening uh, everywhere uh, in Southeast Asia. Um, you see, I'm, I'm not exaggerating when I when I say they all went to Harvard or Stanford. That's not uh, really an exaggeration. All of the Southeast Asian internet companies are missing from the index because of various reasons. One of the main reasons is they don't always have their, their mailing address is sometimes in a developed market. And in Southeast Asia, the, 
the business address you want is in Singapore, but the database says that's a developed country and it doesn't look underneath the hood to see where's the revenue. So none of these companies are in the index, South Korea, even Kazakhstan has a publicly traded super app that's incredibly profitable now on the NASDAQ, check it out, Kospi. Um, okay, here's India. So like a lot of people, we've been waiting for India. We didn't have a lot of exposure to India. There were no Indian internet companies that were public. There was only two, uh, actually. And like a lot of people, we kept saying, well, India will get here. India will get here eventually. But the story was dominated by China. China was 60% of our broad index, and India was a half a percent only a few years ago. But during the COVID, there was 25 Indian internet IPOs. And our world, my business life, went from almost nothing in India to now 17% in our main uh, strategy, our ex-China strategy, even bigger. And we launched an India-only strategy a couple of years ago because we thought this was going to be a pretty good uh, and large opportunity. So now, um, this has been posed as a question on this slide, but this is not a question in my mind. This is an absolute fact, and I will show you why I think that. But I India really is the perfect emerging market, and why can I say that with so much confidence? Well, if we go back to the beginning of the presentation, why are we investing in emerging markets in the first place? They've got a lot of people, better demographics, faster growing economies, and that's driving consumption. And if that's the reason you want to invest in emerging markets, it's not really debatable that India is perfect. It checks every box and it also is number one. And in many ways, it's, it's, there's not going to be a number two. So let's start with the size. India passed China last April, according to the World Bank, to become the largest population on the planet. In gold, you can see China. China's demographics aren't very good anymore. When I got involved with China 20 years ago, they were pretty good. But with, you know, between uh, aging and the one child policy, they look more like a European country now. India, meanwhile, is going to grow every day. India sets a record as the biggest country ever. Tomorrow, it'll be the biggest country ever. The day after that, every day until I'm dead, India is going to be the biggest country ever on that day. And if you look at uh, if you leave out China and you look at the other emerging markets, India is bigger than all of them combined. So there really can't be another story like this uh, anytime in our lifetime. So number one on the first item, big. Young, they're number one there as well. They have more people under the age of 30. They have twice as many people under the age of 30 than we have people in the United States. There's a lot of other dem demographic figures that highlight how powerful this is, the dependency ratio of working age to retired people. The demographics are fantastic for, uh, for India. So biggest, youngest, fastest growing. Not only is it the biggest population and the youngest, and partially because of that, it has the fastest growing economy. Now you can see the 6.5% is the estimate on this chart, and most of the estimates are that uh, India will grow 6.5% this year and next year. But let me tell you that the last three quarters, they've beaten that number. They put up 7% plus twice, and then three weeks ago, they posted 8.4%, almost two full points ahead of the estimates. So I'm one of, of people, well, I, I'm one of several people I know that think India should be able to grow faster than this, and I'll show you why I feel strongly about that. But the reality is they're doing it right now. So biggest, youngest, fastest growing and seeming to accelerate. And that's driving the same thing we saw in China, a rise of the middle class consumer. And if you take all of these things together, India is going to actually pass China and have more consumption than they do in the not too distant Future. So if we go back to the list, it's not, we're not just checking the box. This is A plus exclamation point, exclamation point. This is not something that can really happen again simply because of its scale. So now um, uh, we, 
uh, as I mentioned, we didn't have a lot of stocks until uh, the last um, few years, but um, uh, sorry, I, I seem to have doubled back out of my slides. Okay, why why is India happening now? What, where where has it been? What's what is finally leading it to be in in your uh, on your computer screen and in the newspapers more and more? Here's why this is finally coming together. The, the, the first and most important answer is, is Modi. So Prime Minister Modi is like Deng Xiaoping was to China. So just as Deng Xiaoping unleashed capitalism and free markets in uh, China, so too has Modi done with uh, India. And it is uh, uh, the hugely important to the story. India has been bogged down by socialism and bureaucracy uh, pretty much from the time they got free of the British. And finally, under Modi, uh, the, he is running the place like a business, and he's cutting out a lot of red tape and bureaucracy, simplified the tax code. He's incredibly popular. He will get elected. He just finished his second five-year term. So he's been the prime minister for 10 years. He's going to get reelected in June. So there's no term limits. He could theoretically serve a fourth term after that if he wants to. He's in good health. And the main thing that he's done is get the infrastructure going. When I got involved with China you know, 20 years ago, China and India were, were basically the same size. But what you could see every year was China was building the world's best infrastructure and they got further and further ahead. And meanwhile, in India, the power didn't even work consistently and you'd have brownouts at factories. Modi has basically in 10 years doubled all of the infrastructure that was there when he got there. So whatever they had in the first 65 years, he just doubled it and they're not even close to done. They have a trillion and a half dollar master plan that includes everything. They are fortunate now that the British left a lot of train tracks, but they've got to electrify them. They're about two thirds done with that. They're going to add a lot of new stations and upgrade the stations. Uh, they're making their own high speed trains in the country. They're connecting the cities. This looks just like Shanghai on my first trip there. Um, they are going to triple the number of airports. One of the first luxuries of a emerging market consumer is to get on an airplane for the first time. So they'll triple the number of airports to accommodate that. They're building seaports as well, and they're going to need these if they're going to get jobs from China. So as you know, in Mexico, this China plus one, friend shoring, near shoring, whatever you want to call it, it's going to lead to jobs the manufacturing jobs in India, and it's already happening. Apple will assemble about a quarter of their phones there uh, within the next few years. So, um, and that's an important part of the story. So the infrastructure is finally there for India. And then um, what really sets India above and ab beyond anything else are the following two things. India has a technology sector that's older than I am. So Tata Computer Systems, as it was first call, called, was founded in 1968. So India has a tech sector that's 50 years old. And you have tech companies that have been publicly traded for 20 years, billionaire founders. They've employed more than a half million technologists. And so this ecosystem has existed for a long time in India. On top of that, you have world-class technology schools, 23 institutes of technology modeled after MIT, some of which are harder to get into than Harvard. Um, a lot of their students do go to Harvard. Half of the business school deans now at the top schools are Indian. 25 S&P 500 companies have Indian CEOs, including Microsoft and Google. Both of those CEOs came over as temporary work visa holders originally. So you're not going to find this anywhere else. This is not available in Colombia or Indonesia or Vietnam. This is something that really only India has. And it's very, very important to the story. Now, here is the most important part. So 
it may not be the most important part, but it's the it's the reason that I'm um, incredibly bullish on the story because there's a lot of people now, and and uh, you know it may have been referenced earlier, but you're seeing a lot more about India in the news. And when I talk to investors, the what they tell me is, yeah, I heard India looks really good. I think it looks good, but then they say, but I think it's expensive. It looks like India is, everyone knows India is good and so the stock market's expensive. What I'm going to hope you'll, well, I'll tell you what I think. India is better than people know. And it's because of this India stack and it's not expensive, in my opinion. But let me tell you what this India stack is, this cheat code that India has built. This is, uh, the India stack is a series of digital public infrastructure that has been built to operate the entire country. Now, most people, when I say digital public infrastructure, they don't know what that means. I didn't know what it means. It sounds really boring, though. The best examples of digital public infrastructure that you use probably every day include the internet, right? You, this is a technology system that operates. Everybody can access it. I don't know who built it. You don't really know who built it. We may have seen you know, different versions of how it came together, but somebody made it and and we use it every day, but it's behind the scenes. GPS is another great example. I mean, the whole industries have been built around this access to this location uh, uh, technology that, you know, we, I didn't launch a satellite and I, you probably didn't either, but nonetheless, we can all use it in our uh, daily lives now with our smartphones. Well, India has made its own homemade version of digital public infrastructure that the entire country is running on and it's genius. And I didn't understand it until a year and a half ago and I'm gonna hope to give you an explanation of it that you'll understand. But let's start with the bottom, the foundation of this, which is called Adar, which is an identity layer. Now, the way this whole thing got started was as follows. In 2009, the Indian government decided that it was finally time that they had to create a national identity card system, a national ID card system, where every citizen of the country would get a physical card, like a driver's license, from the Indian government, and it would have their picture and their information, and each one would have their own unique 12-digit number, an ID number. And this was a big undertaking, and they asked this man if he would be in charge. Now, this man here is Nanda Nilkani. He's one of the founders of Infosys. He's currently the chairman of, board, chairman of the board of Infosys. And he's a self-made multi-billionaire. And they asked him to lead this program called Adar. Now, that word in Hindi means foundation. So, again, the foundation of this stack is this identity layer. And so while it was originally envisioned as just a physical card, um, which was pretty important because one of the problems India had was that nobody had identification. And so as you can imagine, it's hard to develop your economy when nobody can prove who they are. And less than half of the babies even had a birth certificate. So it was pretty much a free for all. And so, they asked this guy to be in charge, and he said, I'll be in charge, but if I'm in charge, we're going to use a lot of technology. And so when they launched in 2010, he insisted that not only would everybody get a physical card, but every person would have a scan of their fingertips and their eyes. And that biometric information would be linked to every single 12-digit number. Now, I remember when they launched this and I added this logo to my presentation because again, we, we didn't have any India to talk about, but we had this coming soon slide and, and I added this logo to it, but I didn't pay attention to it. And I definitely don't remember that in 2014, they added another layer, a know your customer layer. And they said, if you're in the database, if you're an Indian citizen and you have gone and registered, you can go into a bank and instantly open a bank account with no paperwork in two minutes. So 
I don't remember hearing about that, but a year and a half ago when I started to go deep into the story of India, I was a little, well, I was a little bit surprised to learn that 95% of the population is now enrolled in this biometric database. They've all got physical and identity cards now, but 800 million people have opened their first ever bank account by walking into a bank and, and a process that would have taken a week got smushed into two minutes times almost a billion people. So they have used this platform, this foundation identity layer to take 800 million people that were not included in the financial system, who were doing everything with paper-based currency and you brought them in, included them in the financial system in a digital way. Now, they passed 1 billion people in the database in 2016. And, and as I'm going to show you, there was a series of things that happened kind of one after another that nobody really understood, but it sent the India digital story into uh, its S-curve. So... Um, uh, 2016, April, Audar passes a billion people. A week later, they launched the next layer of the stack called the Unified Payments Interface or UPI. And this is a payments layer. It's basically QR code based payments. And they made a lot of noise about this. There was so much press coverage. And I frankly, I didn't understand why they were hyping this because Mercado Pago had this, you know, if you went to Brazil many years before this, every place had a QR code. And if you went to China and you went to the 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 you know the 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 market, the the pigeons had QR codes on their on their feet, you know, many years before this. So I thought, well, this isn't really cutting edge, but okay, you've got QR code based payments. And all I really did was add the logo to my presentation. But I didn't pay attention, and I didn't pay attention to this part down here. This is not me using Apple Pay with my Amex card. This is instant transfer of cash from my account to your account or your account to a business account. And there's no cost, no friction. We can send back 10,000 rupees a million times and it would still be 10,000 rupees. So this happened a week after they hit a billion people. I didn't pay attention, but I'll show you what happens in a second. Now, three months later, Reliance Industry launches the first 4G network, GEO. Now, back then, everybody in, in India had gotten a $5 or $10 you know, mobile phone, and all the carriers were on 2G. And there were 10 or 12 carriers, and they were in a price war, and nobody was even investing in 3G. Reliance spends $25 billion to buy the first 4G license, build a brand new from scratch hardware network covering the country ready for 5G and 6G. And they launched in September and they had a very compelling offer, which was unlimited voice calls forever, unlimited data for six months, and then low cost data after this. And they had ambitious goals when they launched. They wanted to sign up 100 million people in the first year. Now, back then, if you went into the Airtel store or the Vodafone store, it took an average of three hours to get a new phone. But because this entire stack, these are all open APIs. So it's not just for the government. Businesses can use this as well. And they, um, the, the uh, uh, Geo use the system and they cut down the time from three hours to five minutes to get a new phone using the open APIs and the Autohar database. So this was sort of the first aha moment when you saw the power, the commercial power of this. And now there's 500 million people on Geo. So you've used this stack to bring five, to bring 800 million people into the banking system in a digital way, and then you've used it to give uh, 500 million people uh, now 5G coverage 
and the lowest cost data on the planet by a mile. They pay, well, in the United States, we pay 50 times as much as they do. It looks like you pay 20 times as much as uh, the Indian smartphone user. And they're using it. You can see that the, the amount of data consumed is the highest on the planet. Now, then at the end of the year, a couple of months later, they did this very, very controversial thing where they took a lot of the large denomination bills out of circulation. If you've got big bills, you need to bring them to the bank immediately. And it, it caused some chaos and people thought it was a terrible idea, but it's turned out to maybe be genius. And then uh, in 2017, they finally fixed this horrible, horrible tax code. I mean, I, used, I thought our tax code was bad here, but it was a mess in, in India. And you think about one of the things they had was every state had its own regime and so if you were a truck going on a 10 hour journey and you had to pass through three states, sometimes the truck had to stop for a full day before it went across the border as they went through manually the tax collector, everything in the truck and made a, a paper receipt. And so these two things happened as well. Now look at what's gone on now with the India digital market. So. The black bars are real-time instant payments on the UPI, and that's $12 billion a month as of December. Now, they just reported the last few months. It's still growing at 55% year over year. And this, this number is about half of the entire globe's instant real-time payments. A very distant second is the PIX network in Latin America. But this uh, has exploded. And and there's only 300 million people using it so far. It's half of the globe's real-time instant payments. But more importantly, the entire Indian economy has gone from cash to digital in seven years. Seven years ago, it was 95% paper-based currency. Nobody paying their taxes. Now it's almost 80% digital. People are paying their taxes. The tax collections of the government are growing faster than the economy, which is getting poured back into infrastructure. So this is, I think, a real secret weapon that uh, India has. And there's more to it. There's other layers to the stack that are coming. And this guy is still running the show. And I think, well, I know this. Very, very few people understand this India stack or have any idea about it. So you think about investing and you know what's reflected in prices. So this is why when people tell me that, yeah, India looks good, I know they don't understand that part. And that's why I'm convinced it's better than people even realize. Now, back to the kind of you know framing up question of is India like China 15 years ago? Kind of, it you know, it had similar GDP numbers. Um, uh, the growth numbers, I thought they seemed kind of low, and it was, but but they've obviously gone up a bit. Um, but the main difference is that nobody on the planet had a smartphone 15 years ago, so India is coming into the stage at a time when you can now get not just get a smartphone, but you can get a brand new smartphone for twelve dollars. It might not be an iPhone 15, but it gets video and it makes payments. So um, you add that to this genius man who has built, not by himself, a lot of people involved, but he has led this series of technological changes that are nonlinear and irreversible and have a compounding effect as they combine. And th this is... There's no, uh, as my partner Burton likes to say, there's no antecedent for this, which means it's never happened before. So this is why I'm so excited about this India uh, story. Now, fine, let's say, all right, if we, we thought China looked good and we bought the China ETF, we lost half our money, what's going to happen in India? Well, the India index is not as bad. Most of the money is in the MSCI India index in the United States. I'm sure that's the case uh, in Mexico as well. And now they have state-owned enterprises, but it's not as bad. I mean, again, 
Uh, China was 80% uh, state-owned enterprises when I got involved. India is only 10%. And they actually, uh, they're privatizing some of these in a way that investors may actually make some money. I don't think it's optimal, but it's not nearly as bad as China. The bigger problem that India has in its index is that the biggest companies don't get any revenue from India. So Infosys and Tata, I mean, these are great companies. They're very important companies. But if you're trying to invest in the growth of India, you're not going to capture it in those companies. In fact, they're barely growing at all. So this is one of the problems in indexing. People don't look under the hood and see where, where you know, the company might be in India, but where does the revenue come from? And indeed, for its biggest tech companies, it is not coming from India. It's coming from the Fortune 500. So, um, and of course, what we're focused on is, is growth. And uh, the growth of some of the big indexes is basically the same as the growth of the economy. So what we're looking for in what we do is the tip of the spear of the growth. Now, let me talk about the valuations because... I hear over and over again, yeah, I hear India is good, but it's expensive. Okay, fine. Let's look at the numbers. Here's the forward P-E ratio of India, the S&P 500, and then a bunch of other emerging markets. And you can see that, yes, India is the most expensive on the, on the slide. Now, I would like to think I've made a pretty strong case that India deserves a premium to places like Turkey and the Philippines and elsewhere. But the PE doesn't mean a thing to me without the G because you're buying the future and the PE without knowing the growth rate is kind of an unanswered question. And so when I put the PE over the growth rate, I don't think it is expensive at all. I mean, yes, it's more expensive than the average emerging market and it's more expensive than Mexico, but not a lot. And it's even cheaper than places like Brazil and Thailand when you think about the peg ratio. So um, now the internet sector, again, is what we focus on. And this is so early in India in so many ways. And so the Indian, you know, the, the Indian economy is going to grow and it'll, it'll essentially have doubled in size in the eight years ended in 2030. But the uh, internet economy is going to explode. It's already happening. And some of the businesses, these are all apps that are, you know, things that you would probably have on your phone, travel app, uh, make my trip, which I've used to buy tickets and uh, hotel rooms and so forth. Um, uh, InfoEdge. These are the two stocks that we've owned for 10 years. These were the only public internet companies in India for a long time. This one does job ads and, and real estate ads, and it is incredibly profitable. It's ended up investing in 25 other internet companies, two of which have gone public. Zamato, the DoorDash of India, of which it owns 12%. Now, let me just say a couple of things about Zamato, because for, for many reasons, when I talk to people, you know, I'll tell people that Mercado Libre is the Amazon.com of Brazil and things like, just to make it simple for people. Um, and in most cases, that's not really a fair comparison. You probably, you all probably know that you, you can't call Amazon the Mercado Libre of America until I get my checking account there and my ETFs at Amazon. Um, and so the, there's never really a pure comparison. And so with Zomato, you know, when when DoorDash showed up in the United States, we had plenty of restaurants. We we were not short of restaurants. It was very well developed. Well. In emerging markets, eating out at a restaurant is a luxury spend. And, and so as they move on up, they'll eat at restaurants more often. But uh, the restaurant industry is quite young. And so Zomato's opportunity is, isn't just to deliver food for the restaurants. It's actually got a chance to become sort of the operating system for the restaurant industry. And as part of that evidence, its fastest growing business is selling products to restaurants. So the input food and other restaurant pro uh, needs are sold uh, by Zomato as well. <clears throat> Online insurance, Policy Bazaar has about 60% market share. Also invested in by InfoEdge. 
online beauty products. Again, the per capita spending on all of these categories is so, so early. Beauty products for sure. This company was started by a woman investment banker who decided she wanted to be an entrepreneur before she turned 50. And now she's one of two self-made women billionaire in India. Online gaming and finally online payments. Now, as I've said a few times, we didn't have a lot of India exposure, but I had a list of unicorns in my deck. And I also had a slide, well, this slide, because this was the highest profile unicorn for many years. And I featured it because both Berkshire Hathaway and Alibaba were early investors. Now, um, last spring, I was in India for a few weeks and I gave presentations for the CFA in Bombay and in Delhi and in Bangalore. And in every one of those meetings, I had the following question slash comment. And the first one was, because what happened was Paytm went public in, in the fall of 2021 at the very top. India had an internet bubble and Paytm top ticked it. And, and by the time I visited India, all of them were down 50, 60%. And so all these young CFA charter holders or candidates said to me, Indian internet companies are bad investment. They don't go up. They only go down. Now, I hopefully most of you, you know, understand that the stocks do go down sometimes and they can go up too. And 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 I think everyone knows you're supposed to try to buy them when it looks bad and, and not buy them when everything looks good. But nonetheless, they seem to have been burned pretty bad um, by this. And so they all told me that, no, you can't invest in our internet companies. And then they said another thing that was interesting to me, which was they don't know how to make money. These are unproven companies. They've raised all this venture capital. They're young. They don't have any real experience. And while they're growing, they're not making any profits. That isn't true. When I first looked, we had three unprofitable companies. And now we only have one, which ironically is Berkshire Hathaway's uh, backed uh, pay TF. And not only are they profitable, some of these are world-class kind of margins. You don't find a lot of 86% operating margins in the world, but we've got two of them in this mix of companies. So um, profitable companies. Now, th they did go down a lot. Um, there's no doubt. And this is our performance um, uh, in calendar year 2023, but we're still down uh, since inception. Now, we missed most of the crash. We didn't, I'm, I'm not claiming that we're market timers. We launched this as soon as we could when there was enough stocks. But if we had launched when Paytm went public, we would be down 50% since inception. And that's even after a 30% uh, rise. So my point here is the a lot of stocks are selling at, at all-time highs. The Indian internet sector had a bubble. The bubble burst. It's still below where it was two years ago. Um, and then in terms of what's in the sector, you know, they're all internet app-based types of businesses, but you've got banking, financial services, e-commerce, food, travel, et cetera. And looking at the valuations again, the internet stocks have a peg of less than one, but the broad indexes, uh, yeah, this doesn't worry me. So someone tells you India looks expensive, ask them to define that for you and let me know what they tell you. I, I don't think India is in any way, shape or form uh, in any type of a bubble or gross overvaluation situation. So, all right, rid of the risk to India. This sounds great. China sounded great. What's gonna happen here? Well, the risks that I see are first and foremost Modi, that you have key man risk in India more than any other place on the planet. There's no organization that is more dependent on uh, a single person right now as India is because he's he's got good lieutenants below him, but he is the spirit and the embodiment of this whole thing. He has willed this to be, and he is incredibly popular. He will get reelected for certain um, he's in good health. There's no term limits. He could theoretically serve again. 
But there have been people in India that were prime minister that left early. Um, uh, they've had uh, two assassinations that were part of the second risk, which is religious and sectarian violence. It uh, is still happens in India all the time. So the the tensions between the Muslims and the Hindus and 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 the Sikhs up in the Punjab. I mean, there's a lot of different groups and a lot of conflicts. So. To me, the biggest risk is Modi leaves uh, somehow. The second risk is related to the first one. Um, everything is lined up for them to get jobs. They know they need jobs. They have a high youth unemployment rate. Uh, international manufacturers want to go there, and they're doing everything they can to make it easier for them. It sounds like we'll get an announcement from Tesla in the coming week or two about a multi-billion dollar investment into India. But until it happens, it remains a risk. Um, you have uh, big gaps between the rich and the poor, as you do pretty much everywhere. And uh, the climate element is very acute in India. It, it, the southeast of India is historically flooded about a third of the time. And uh, that's before rising sea level. So that's an issue. And then the heat along the Ganges River has been getting to 130 degrees in the summertime. So um, some some issues there. But I think that the case uh, is still incredibly strong. You have size and scale and demographics that are unmatched. Everything you're looking for in emerging markets, you have the fastest growth, which has also beaten the estimates. You have this uh, finally, an infrastructure foundation going in and a human capital foundation that's unmatched. The digital stack, I've told you what I think about that. And and then, you know, in a world like today's where you've got wars in Russia and, 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 and other horrible, uh, violent things going on in the Middle East and tensions between the U.S. and China, India is in this incredibly unique place where they can buy Russian oil for one third off of the market price and they can still have dinner at the White House and get a standing ovation. So the geopolitical position they're in is is quite unique. You have these sort of two factions on on the you know the US side and then the China Russia side, but then the in the middle, India uh, is uh, in this. Uh, almost Switzerland-like of position. So, and finally, I think the values, uh, in spite of what people keep telling me, I think the valuations are very reasonable. So, sorry I went a few minutes over uh, the hour. I'm happy to uh, answer any questions that might be here. And Francisca, you can ask them um, if you like, or I can uh, 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 read them myself. Oh, uh, yeah, thank you. So we haven't gotten any questions so so far so I, to entice... can you ask from here oh yeah go ahead all right go ahead. thank you great slides and presentation congrats uh i mean i love the story you don't have to sell it to me uh but but this is extremely useful now i have two questions one is what about near shoring uh, because we hear stories about the the advantages of india in this uh, near shoring, reshoring, whatever, um, and also, is is there a way where one of the two candidates in the U.S. can disrupt the favorable the favorable geopolitic geopolitical situation you already mentioned, which seems okay for now, but what can change there? Okay, so I, you know, I think that it's it's widely believed that. Two, the two or two of the three leading uh, countries to benefit from French shoring or China plus one, whatever I call it, are China and Mexico. Now, Mexico for the U.S. market has obvious, uh, you know, geographic advantages. Both countries need to step it up on the infrastructure. I mean, that's to me the 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 challenge. You know, India is definitely building up its infrastructure, but the reason that we make everything in China is because they make it better and cheaper than anybody else. I mean, if it was easy to go make uh, these things in in easier or, or, or cheaper in Mexico or China, they would have been made there before. So, and it, with the in the case of India, you know, the port eighty percent of world trade gets on a boat. Now, that's not the case with with most of the Mexican U.S. trade, but 
80% of global trade gets on a boat and China's got the best ports and the most port capacity uh, in the world. So it's going to be a while before India can match that. So, but I, I think that, um, uh, I think both Mexico and India are going to, to benefit because as much as I can say it's going to cost more, it doesn't matter. The forces that are, you know, causing this are set in motion. So, so I think that again, in, India will benefit from that. Um, India also has a, a pretty significant domestic consumer market, so it, it it shouldn't end up nearly as dependent on exports as it's, it certainly won't be as dependent on uh, exports as China has been. And then in terms of the question about um, the U.S. presidential candidates and and could they uh, somehow become uh, antagonistic with India. It's certainly possible. I mean, we've we've obviously, you know, become very antagonistic with China, and now the the um, you know, from when the time I got involved with China twenty years ago, that people were already suspicious of China, right? They're communist. They're evil. They're making up the numbers. I mean, I read. Mean, I've heard every version of China distrust you could imagine. Um, and so that I, I think India will never, it, it will be very hard for India to get um, uh, demonized as much as China. The other thing is that, and I've said this before, that if we did more trade with India, we'd probably have a trade war with them because they are very protective. And they've made it very hard for uh, uh, some uh, uh, industries to compete. And and they're still doing a lot of things to favor themselves. They kicked out all the Chinese apps. And there, yeah, there was, a, in, in my world, there was a pretty high profile case where um, there was a, an Indian retailer called Future Group that had gotten into some financial trouble and they had agreed to be acquired by Amazon. And they completed a transaction. And then a couple months later, Reliance Industries and Mukesh Ambani decided they wanted to buy the future group. And they talked the CEO into walking away from this done deal with Amazon and to sell the future group to Reliance. And the Singapore, Amazon sued in Singapore and the Singapore court said, you already got bought. Like, you, this is already done. And then when it got to the Indian courts, they said, no, actually, you can sell yourself to Reliance. So, so your question, I, no one's asked me this yet, but I have thought about it. it, it but it's certainly possible that in 10 years, if, if, India is thriving and, you know, the U.S. manufacturing isn't working well or India has taken the semiconductor manufacturing role, then then absolutely uh, whoever our leader is could decide that we want to, uh, you know, have economic beef with them. But I, that's not going to happen anytime soon is the good news. So uh, but it's a great question and, 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 and an interesting one to think about. But I, it's not on my radar yet, but. But if all goes well, it probably will be, frankly. <laughs> Fair enough. Thank you very much. Thank Bye you. Me. Hi, thank you for the interesting presentation, Kevin. Thank My you. question is regarding corporate governance in India. Is that a concern in any specific sector or uh, how can, can investors um, understand this uh, risk? or potential risk in India? Okay, well, I, I think it's absolutely a risk in all emerging markets. And I think it's also um, it remains a risk uh, in India. So let me, let me start at the high level. So, you know, India has a number of these very powerful families uh, that most have a publicly traded stock or in the case of the Adani group, eight publicly traded stocks. And 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 they were the they were the um, uh, there's a short seller called Hindenburg Research that came out about a year ago and accused them of all sorts of uh, improprieties and it this is a you know hundred billion dollar plus company so this is a, a large operation 
they do a lot of the big construction, the ports as well at Donnie Group. And the 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 company, the 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 eight different companies he's involved with collectively lost a lot of value after these accusations. They've largely recovered, but from my experience in emerging markets, when you have a, a family-owned, multi-generational company that one company owns part of another company, and the you know the the brothers, the chairman here, and the sisters, the you know chairman, these things seem like places where you could find accounting irregularities or other um, uh, you know uh, governance issues. So it, it wouldn't surprise me if part of the Adani story was true or some other large uh, business had similar problems, that's not gonna derail India, but it, it certainly could give a black eye to the, the stock market. Now, again, one of the things that I think is great about the internet companies in emerging markets is they, on an absolute basis, they have very good corporate governance, but on a relative basis, you'd have to say they have exceptional corporate governance because most of them have been funded by U.S. institutional investors. Like, you know, the original foundational paperwork very well involved a Silicon Valley uh, investor. That doesn't guarantee better corporate governance, but it's a, a pretty good head start. Now, the other thing that I would, and I'm, I'm going to kind of blend two things here together but there's i think 3000 or so indian public companies and the the um the msci index it includes 121 the the the, the main msci india index and then it, there's also a small mid cap one that owns about 500 companies so you're talking about we call it 600 companies that are in the indexes where I can see the valuations and, and have a, at least a general sense of the companies. But you've got another 2,000 smaller operations. And I'd seen in the media a couple of weeks ago that there was a crackdown on speculation in some of these small cap companies. And here again, when I look at the peg ratio for the small and mid cap MSCI, it's 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 not expensive at all. It has a peg ratio of also about one. Um, so what I think is happening is in that smaller, uh, you know, the the two thousand uh, smaller companies. I think there's reason to be very worried about that. And one of the things that um, uh, I've been fortunate in the last decade to have built friendships with five different Indian investors who are all my age or older than me, most of them. And some of them are very successful. Um, uh, all of them are very successful. One of the, at least one of them, maybe two are billionaires. And, and I've been able to glean and, and try to absorb as much from them as possible. And one of them, the first time we met at a coffee shop in New York City, he took out a piece of paper and he drew me a pie chart. He said, here's the Indian stock market. And he said, all right, you know, this percent state on enterprises, you don't want those. This percent you can't invest in, right? And then there was, you know, the small, I'm making up the numbers, but about 20% are investable companies. And he said, he told me the story about the, the way that they treat corporate governance in that sort of uninvestable uh, space. And the idea was that the, 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 the founders don't really understand or respect outside investors. And the example he gave was a real world example in which he and his group had invested $10 million to buy 10% of a company at a $100 million valuation. And the company worked really well and they had an offer to buy the company for a billion dollars. And the founders said, well, you guys, you guys can't have a hundred million dollars. That's too much, right? He said, "Well, what, we own ten percent." And he said, "Yeah, but I did all the work, and you guys didn't do anything." And that basically, they had got a big lawsuit because the guy, his feeling was it didn't matter that you had 
bought 10 percent he had done the work and that ultimately he would uh uh, do a deal in a way that would would screw them to pardon the the uh, term. So I, I think there is a, an issue, a cultural issue with corporate governance. Um, but I think it's in this the 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 large number of small and mid cap companies that aren't really part of of my universe. So again, I go back to these internet companies are on a relative basis, exceptionally well-managed versus things like Petrobras, right? If you want to own Mercado Libre or Petrobras, where do you think you're going to get better corporate governance? So, but that doesn't, that doesn't guarantee, you know, good corporate governance, but I think it's a pretty good head start. I, I have one. Sorry, go ahead. No, just was thanking Kevin. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, thank you for the question. Sure. So, Kevin, I, I have I have one question, which is a little bit related to, you know, political risk. So when we have China, you know, the risk was that a mad emperor was going to come and uh, it was going to just be more difficult to invest in places like China. And eventually that risk seems to have materialized, as you mentioned, with Alibaba and everything. But now with India, what you have is the risk of a dysfunctional democracy, right? Like Modi is relatively democratic, you know, at least for emerging market standards. But the problem with that sort of environment is that eventually democracy becomes too protracted, you know, and you can see that in Latin America where you can argue that Latin America just doesn't grow because the political process just doesn't enable competition and new actors to start playing in and where, you know, the actors are just too entrenched. How do you assess that? risk in India? What do you think about, you know, India being a victim of its own democratic su success in the medium term? And, you know, just slowing growth down permanently, you know, uh, for 20 or 50 years? Well, I don't like the idea of it. I, certainly it's possible. I mean, anything's sort of possible. Um, I, uh, now, I, I guess the other thing I would say, I, it's not clear to me, it's not even, it, it it is clear to me that China hasn't done nearly the, the 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 number of bad things that people say the Chinese government have done is is I don't agree with most of the things people point at right that Jack Ma's missing tech cracked out I mean, you know Google Facebook Apple these people pay fines all the time in Europe in the United States and we you know. The, those things happen. China tries to regulate. Everyone says, oh, my gosh, Jack Ma's missing. And they're trying to squish the Internet. Look, these people have benefited from capitalism more than anybody. And if you think Xi Jinping's going to go away from capitalism, you know, that it's possible, but highly unlikely. And and the government has done everything they can to to make it clear that they're not trying to kill the Internet. But it doesn't matter. The headlines say it enough times you, there's no undoing that. And when Xi Jinping says, no, we support Alibaba, that doesn't make headlines. The uh, the delisting fears about China, that was a US-led thing, and that was also stupid. That's gone away and isn't going to happen. But but so, so it, it's not clear to me that, that China didn't deliver the growth or that the Chinese government messed everything up, but there's definitely the tensions between the US and China have messed up sentiment in a massive way. Um, so could India be a victim of its own success? I, I guess, yes, because I mean, look, the one thing we've learned on the planet is it doesn't matter how the leader gets there. It doesn't matter if it's a monarchy or communism or democracy. If the person in charge loses their mind or otherwise gets erratic, all bets are off and it, it does it really doesn't matter how they got there and so it, yes if, at some point modi won't be the prime minister and and is there uh, a way that happens or a, 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 a you know if the is the next prime minister gonna gonna um, be a problem or will there be significant um infighting Politically, I don't know how to think about that. I, I I do know that you know when 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 a country is successful and the leader is associated with that success, 
they tend to stick around and 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 get the you know and and be popular and so i guess if i was thinking about it i think that and there's a great profile that just out today i'll make sure to send it uh to the host so that they could circulate it's it's a newsweek profile of of modi that just showed up this afternoon but um uh i think that they're doing so well right now and he's got such a high approval rating and if they continue the way i think that they will i i think the whole country is going to um uh expect these these the direction of this to continue and want it to continue so um uh, but they have a a, a comp complicated political system a complicated current political situation but at present as we're here on the phone or on the zoom it, it, modi and the bjp are loved i mean they have an 80 percent approval rating and uh and for good reason i mean they've they've they have uh in 10 years taken this country uh to a point where uh, uh, there was an article yesterday and the in Bloomberg the headline was uh India could pass China in terms of global GDP growth contribution that India could become a bigger contributor than China by 2028 now the fact that that's even a headline or a, something that could be a possibility speaks a lot about how well the current uh, administration's done so and anyway, I, I don't know that I answered your question. I've, I've a lot of my yeah. words were just thinking out loud about the question, but um, we'll see what happens. But but right now Modi's there, and I think he'll be there for five more minutes or five more years. No, thank you very much. Uh, it it it's a very I think it's a very good answer. So um, I believe we're reaching the end of the hour. So is, does anybody have any other question, comment, idea, and so on that we can? Take advantage of Kevin being here. Please go ahead. Well, um, uh, let me just thank you again for uh, tuning in and 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 hearing uh, the presentation. And thank you to uh, to you guys for setting it up and hosting. And I would love to hear from any or all of you if you uh, want to connect on LinkedIn or if you have specific questions. Uh, or things you want to ask about, by all means, uh, feel free to email me or connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, you can call me as well. My phone number is there. But it doesn't happen very often these days. And uh, I may be in Mexico City in May. Uh, so maybe I'll, uh, if, if you do call me, maybe we'll end up uh, connecting uh, when I uh, come to Mexico City uh, next month. And that'd Thank be you, great. Kevin. Thanks very much. Thank you all. A great presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you all for connecting.